Okay, hello, welcome back to our discourse program here at CTM and to the second session today that is looking at the legacy of Mark Fisher and especially also of his work as K-Punk. This session is called After K-Punk, Labor, Death and Cultural Artifacts and it's looking at, yeah, the production of cultural artifacts and the cultural logics they produce or from which they stem from and how cultural analysis and criticism can unravel these processes and intervene in them, I guess. And I'd like to welcome again Terence Sharp, who has put together these two sessions for us here at CTM and together with Transmediale. Uh, Terence, um, Terence is an artist and a researcher based here in Berlin. I had introduced him before, so I'm not sure if you were there with the other session. But yeah, he's an author and he publishes with quite some different uh, uh, publishing houses or also works with different project spaces and art spaces like Trust and Spike Quarterly or the Phi Center in Montreal. And he's also uh, affiliated with the New York-based research collective Anon and a member of the New Center for Research and Practice. And i like you to welcome him and the fellow panelists that he will introduce. Thank you. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Jan, and thanks again to CTM and Transmedial for helping make this happen. Um, again, like the first panel, rather than read out lengthy bios, I might just ask the panelists, Dane and Danver, to introduce themselves briefly and talk a little bit about what they do. Rather than me listing out every single publication and all that, it's, you know, we're trying to keep it a little fluid and, you know. You can do that if you want. But <laughs> Pardon? Um, yeah, sure, so my name's Danver. Um, and I teach at Goldsmiths um, College in the Department of Visual Cultures. Um, and I guess I tried to um, write and talk and teach about certain elements of um, contemporary music culture uh, through the lens of questions of race and class. That's generally about it. Uh, my name is Dane Sutherland. I am a curator. I work under the name Most Dismal Swamp, which is a kind of experimental curatorial art project and a record label um, starting to put out some music soon, tomorrow, and producing exhibitions and films. Um, I should be at home also finishing my PhD on contemporary art and the speculative turn and just generally hanging out with art stuff and music stuff. That's what I do. Thanks very much for being honest. Those things are much more honest than when people just read out this thing. I think it's a bit nicer. Um, the last panel was, to a degree, a bit more fluid and a bit more open discussion. But I think given Dan Verndane's backgrounds, I've actually prepared a few questions to go into just because I think given their knowledge, I want to keep things maybe a little bit more specific. But maybe it'll go off the rails and that's totally okay as well. But um, I guess the first question I'd have is, given that we're talking about artifacts, you know, both artifact and artifact, um, could we try and agree, first of all, on a definition as to what we mean when we say cultural artifact and cultural logic? Yeah, I mean, um, I can't help but think that, like, when I think about a cultural artifact, it's nothing that's particularly special. It's just, like, what we do, what we produce. Like, a cultural artifact is an artwork or a song, but it's also the way we pronounce our vowels or the way we sit in the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like normal things, but like some cultural artifacts have more resources than others to kind of contribute to a cultural logic. Mm -hmm. Some things, some cultural artifacts might work towards um, sedimenting particular logics, for example, artworks that, well not artworks, but cultural artifacts, for example, Big Brother, like you mentioned, is a cultural artifact that might kind of sediment the logic of a kind of individualism or um, a certain kind of way of, uh, I don't know, like um, a certain kind of um, set of coordinates for how people might want to kind of mm -hmm. perceive themselves or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but then I guess you get other cultural artifacts which maybe disrupt that or maybe disrupt some kind of uh, bit of an aged term that we need to get rid of, but we mm -hmm. um, get cultural artifacts that maybe mutate these logics in one way or another. 
I mean, the way I think about it a little bit is there's this fantastic quote from Reza Negaristani's Cyclonopedia where he talks about strategic weapons that governments deploy. And that might be something like a new tax system, it might be something like trying to rig an election or something, but the artifact of that is what the, is like the after effect of it, you know? Mm. It's like the, the dust that's left over at the end that no one had any intention of starting. But I don't I mean, Danver, what's your take on that? Um, I agree with, um, with Dane that culture should broadly be understood as stuff that people do. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think in terms of cultural logic and cultural artifact, I tend to go for some what might be thought of as old-fashioned words. Mm -hmm. So ideology mm -hmm. and art, uh, they would be the two, two terms I'd rather go for than cultural logic and cultural artifact. Um, and that's just down to a, um, a desire not to unnecessarily complicate things uh, when thinking about a question of culture. Because mm -hmm. um, if, if um, I think something perhaps important we learned from Mark is that if there's any purpose to cultural criticism or intellectual labor, it's to, to try best to explain how things work. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, that's obviously not always easy to do. And in fact, it's quite an impossible task. That's why we keep on at it. But... Um, that's also assuming that the intellectual labor is itself intentional and deliberate and not, you know, graft onto someone. Uh, could, if you could expand on that. On well, you if you that? think about something, I mean, I think someone from the pre pre previous uh, discussion in the audience, they uh, asked about something in relation to the um, colonization of cognition by capital. It's kind of like, it's a, it's a slightly tired trope maybe. Yeah. But like, there is an effect that comes from platform capitalism that does colonize people's cognition. And that's, it's undeniable. It's just not necessarily the newest thing to say about it. But that is a kind of intellectual labor that you do, which is very extractive. And that's not the intentional intellectual labor that you would see in something like the K-Punk project. Okay. Um, I don't think all intellectual labor is de facto captured because then I don't think there'd be a desire for it to be captured in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's important to understand what you're, what you're um, drawing upon and what uh, is being mapped out when you use terms like capital and use terms like uh, cognitive capital. Mm -hmm. And it's um, if, if uh, uh, whatever we think of as capital wouldn't work the way it did if it didn't keep on coming and hunting for us. Mm -hmm. So there's something that we're doing mm -hmm. that it keeps on wanting to chase. And it keeps on wanting to pursue and 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 uh, 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 transform into something else. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it wouldn't do that. Otherwise, it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't need to to be so violent and be so excessive, because there's something that we keep on doing that it, it can't quite get hold of. So I think um, everyone is involved in some element of intellectual labour. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's just that it operates at different levels of in. Intensity. It doesn't mean it's it's. Um, it doesn't mean one is captured and one isn't. Mm -hmm. I think that's a question that Mark was perhaps tussling with um, quite a lot throughout his his own writing. Like, to what extent is his own labour captured, mm -hmm. um, and to what extent isn't it? And I think that's that. He might have been a lot more hopeful about things than people often frame him as being. Not quite sure what next to ask. It was just your last point there about how his work was captured, but maybe we'll come back to that in the question after this one, I think, but just in relation to the adopting of his ideals in the wrong way. But um, a question that I asked the previous panel, and I think it bears repeating, just so I'd like your take on it, um, was uh, I was asking why uh, Mark Fisher never gave like strict instructions as to what culture should do, but there was a diagnostician element to it, okay? But like what I was getting with that is that um, Referencing Nietzsche's in Beyond and Good and Evil, he asks, you know, well, sorry, Nietzsche asks, you know, what are the conditions uh, which great cultural artifacts can emerge? And Fisher is asking this question in 2006, and of course he's looking um, through a Nietzschean prism uh, at Celebrity Big Brother, highlighting uh, his, this fellow blo blogger, uh, Marcello, who said, uh, where once we uh, assembled in front of screens or stages uh, to gasp and awe at people doing and cheering things we could never hope of doing ourselves, uh, now all we require is a humbling mirror. So what he's talking about here is celebriality, but one which does not benefit the working classes uh, it attempts to empathize with, but sells them a false alternative or false narrative. 
And uh, we can see that about Celebrity Big Brother, but I'm trying to think about, you know, that was written in 2006, and I'm trying to think about the current moment now. Like, how could we say that element of celebrity has changed in relation to something like, I don't know, like user-generated content in TikTok, you know? Or even just the cult of the YouTube star, you know? There's like, there has been a shift that's taken place there, I think. I feel like in that instance, um, it kind of refers to like how I defined what I felt like a cultural artifact might be. It's like something that kind of maybe props up or something that kind of diverts from um, a kind of ideology or a cultural logic. Um, and Mark's work seemed to kind of um, definitely be quite coruscating and critical over things that were um, kind of blindly upholding logics that were kind of detrimental to kind of actual kind of more adventurous forms of cultural production or creating kind of artifacts that kind of acted as a kind of cognitive scaffold perhaps for kind of building kind of new ideas. Um, but then to add to his, that kind of like suggestion that his role was maybe of a kind of diagnostic, diagnostician, that he was also like, I think really into like winding up young people and, and like challenging them like quite, quite forcefully. Um, and that was all about like at the, at the very start of that quote, he's kind of interested in the, the conditions that foster or the conditions that mire um, cultural production. Um, and then kind of asking like a group, uh, a room full of young people to like name a kind of movement in music that has had the same traction as disco is bound to kind of like get up people's, get people's backs up. But I think that's something he attempted really hard to do to kind of make them think about the conditions under which they're making music or making cultural artifacts. But that's a good provocation to make though. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was one of his points was, is that, is this on? Um, Thanks. Um, I guess his point was that it's like he's not, to, to go to your question about why he never um, kind of, what was it, he didn't tell people what kind of cultural products to make or, I mean he was a critic and he was, in winding people up, he was kind of, in my view, um, asking people to kind of um, question those conditions under which they're making. For example, one of his, one of his examples, I remember, was, um, talking about um, Joy Division, for example, but the reason they kind of were able to kind of make those albums they did was because they kind of had the kind of framework of like um, um, English, like welfare at the, at the time, which is kind of, and by bringing that up, he's kind of referred to kind of the, the nosedive that has taken in recent years and the kind of inability or the kind of, it's no longer a cradle for cultural production in the same way as it once was. Um, I think, um, The, the, the question of kind of new points of mediation for, for um, mass culture, so you know, TikTok, YouTube stars, etc., becomes um, interesting depending on, again, the lenses and the, and the approach you're taking to that, that question. So when you, when you ask that question, it kind of immediately thought of um, uh, a filmmaker like Arthur Jaffer, whose entire works are composed of found, you could call an old-fashioned art term, found materials. He's kind of searched through the, what you could call the detritus of, of mass culture and sculpt, and carved out this, a, a kind of sculpture from it. Um, so I'm wondering in what that sense that work like that, and I think there's a whole bunch of artists who, who kind of work in a similar way, use a similar modality. Um, an artist like Adam Farah, also known as Free Yard, kind of, he's, he's built this project around um, basically this, this um, for a period Mariah Carey appeared on a kind of television sales channel, you know where you kind of sell goods to people on, through TV, and she constantly used the term moment as like a noun, a verb, an adjective. Um, and he's kind of created, first of all he's created this piece out of her appearances on like, I think it's called QVC, QVC. but He's not looking at it with irony or kind of as a as a kind of sense of pastiche. He takes that as a kind of ur text, the moment. He says basically Mariah is involved in a, a, a type of theorization, uh, a kind of uh, a theorization of time, uh, which he then uses as a basis for whole other works he creates. So it becomes a kind of template. This appearance of Mariah Carey on on QVC, um, and yeah, he's absolutely deadly serious about it. And I think that's the 
the challenge it poses. So I'm thinking, yeah, um, it's, it's easy to symptomize kind of um, mass media, and well, not mass media, but new, new technologies, but again, people are doing something on there. And it's up to us to, to look harder and look kind of, uh, find new ways of looking um, and listening, perhaps. Um, I, I'm asking this question even though I know you have an answer for it, but you know. Um, but are there any parts of Mark Fisher's work that you think have been badly adapted? And acid communism is one that comes to mind. Um, because I think it has been done a disservice in many respects as it gets reduced to um, a leftist consciousness raising project and for some reason through psychedelics. Um, and that fails to co uh, communicate the complexity Fisher was alluding to. And that's something that I think maybe I didn't mention in the first panel that I would have liked to is that what Mark Fisher was very good at doing was diagnosing incredible complexity in a way that was very palpable to someone like me as a young student who didn't feel at home in the department I was in into the next department that I went to because of very old-fashioned academic rigor. So I think, I mean, that's maybe something to just think about in terms of that it was uh, uh, making complexity accessible. That was a thing, another essential thing of the Kate Punk project. But, um, and that's why when I hear reductive analysis of acid communism as something that no one knows what it was going to be anyway, um, that's something that, you know, it bothers me quite a bit. But yeah, I'd like to uh, ask you what then is your take on post-colonial melancholia? You know, um, his idea that uh, Trump's rise make American grand Brexit. These were uh, different facets of the same phenomenon. Phenomenon's a kind of a strange word to use there, but you know, I appreciate that Trump's election happened along racial lines. And post-colonial melancholia is a pathology rooted in enlightenment thinking. And I've spoken to American friends about this, but the fear of the other that finds safety in the illusion of the white suburb um, these are breaking points, and, but there's a breaking point where some shift could be possibly mobilized. And I think that's something, again, that he was trying to get across with the, with the acid communism, as well as that, that, that safety of the white suburb that instigates things like Trump being elected and Brexit happening, even though you can't think of those two things as the same phenomenon at all, but that that was something that was temporary. And that, you know, the last available lecture from Mark Fisher online is all of this is temporary. And a weird thing I read recently was, um, it wasn't like a published, um, something that Mark published, but it was um, um, a transcript from one of the seminars that he conducted with his students, with, and they were kind of questioning the term acid communism. Um, so, I mean, that kind of speaks to the fact that it was like an unfinished introduction, but it was also an unfinished project as well that probably wasn't even finished the naming process. Um, I, I presume that he might, might have kind of done that work th with and through the kind of seminars he conducted with his students. Um, and then part of that kind of um, misinterpretation or misapplication of something like acid communism might just come in through the kind of fact that it maybe wasn't fully named yet. Like, um, it just it brings up certain kind of um, conceptual resources that are maybe right or wrong to what he wanted to do with it in the end. Um, and a lot of the things he's been, I mean, it, like uh, we've spoken before, how he kind of really had a kind of like perverse inter interest in kind of like flipping, like coining like neologisms um, and kind of seeing what kind of legs they had and seeing what kind of like um, worlds they kind of conjured. Um, and some of these kind of terms like were just kind of used really badly, like um, like potentially acid communism and like, uh, like accelerationism as well, which is something that's like, it was just uh, part of the reason that kind of maybe didn't fare so well is because it was named just incorrectly. But like, um, I think one of the kind of issues with acid communism is that it kind of refer. This is just the kind of the, the kind of psychedelic kind of tropes it brings up with acid. When he's not, I don't think he was necessarily playing entirely with that. But then instead of referring to a confluence of resources that kind of occurred under a particular kind of, um, he was refer he's referring to those conditions again, the conditions of like the 60s and the 70s that kind of fostered kind of new different ways of thinking or different kind of imaginaries. Um, and something like psychedelia can be eclipse that perhaps, like, or kind of give it a kind of romantic kind of tenor. Um, there was lots in that question that I think that needs um, to even try to approach it some quite careful unpacking and kind of careful navigation through. Um, so I think the first thing, like so you said, post, you mentioned post-colonial melancholia. So I think it's important um, 
to always recognize like n no one person or no one person or no one person who thinks any person who thinks as as in everyone because everyone thinks has a handle on everything and uh, everyone who thinks as in everyone has limit points and has gaps and has blind spots um so in regards to post colonial melancholia certainly and as as Matt's taught us through his book uh Mark had lots of rich and wonderful things to say about melancholia but i would say for me unfortunately he didn't have anything to say about the post colonial um and then if you extend that or link that then to something like acid communism it's quite correct that it's we don't know where he was going with it we only have what a few hundred words maybe a, a, even under a thousand words i think it's not even it's a few pages of a chapter with gaps as well yeah, yeah. So we can't really tell where he's going with it. But s something about the way it's been taken, taken up into acid Corbynism or a kind of attempt to re re reinvigorate um, uh, left politics or Labour Party politics um, might actually point to some of the limits of Marx's own thinking. And, so, and, the, uh, the, and they weren't only his own, they were kind of part of a perhaps part of the a group of thinkers he was thinking with and that comes down to something like you could call Sorry, would you be talking about Marcus there or Zizek or uh, yeah 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 uh, um, thinkers that he was talking about people he was directly in conversation with um, I think you could call it something like a provincialism or even a parochialism that's that's at work in that in that thought and it really comes down for me to the question of how how class is conceived in that in that thought now i think Mark, the brilliance of marx's work was that what he was able to really forcefully put on the table was this idea that okay popular music was a a revolutionary class pol a project right it was a means by which a working class working class youth were able to re-engineer the lines of force within a society and that's undeniable that's the evidence is there right from the 60s the 70s the 80s up until the 90s popular music was this class project it's engine uh, perhaps the most revolutionary class project that had been available in the 20th century you know would you uh, say that was with the consumption of music or with its availability no it's production and its consumption um it it um but i'd say the the issue that i sometimes had with reading mark's work on that period of popular music and i think the stuff that he takes on from the likes of Zizek, Bifo Barardi and others is that um their conception of class was highly limited so if you think about that period in the 60s and 70s and 80s when pop music was at its most intense in terms of its cycles of change adaptation newness kind of appearing in that period particularly in britain which seemed to be marx's particular focus the british conception of class understanding of class was undergoing a massive upheaval and the reason it was going up, undergoing a massive upheaval is that these people turned up from the colonies to become a new labor force and one could argue that w one of the uh, primary en energies flowing through popular music over that period was down to the fact that class was undergoing a huge upheaval right that, that it was actually the driving engine of british popular music was something like dub was funk was the kind of the, the way that hip hop traveled to the to the UK and um i think mark didn't have an adequate account of that and i think that's perhaps why acid communism has been adapted the way it is because if you th if you look at what he maps out with regards to acid communism in that short short chapter if you read a different lineage of music writers and, mu and cultural critics you see you could see it mapped out for, it's been mapped out for years already if you read someone like amiri baraka now baraka in his in his book on black music uh which is a kind of mapping out of free jazz as it emerged he has this brilliant line and i think it's about coltrane or it might be about sun ra and he says if you listen to enough of this music it will make you think a lot of strange and wonderful things and you might even become one of them right so you got baraka you got someone like greg tate you got Nathaniel Mackey all of these thinkers have been mapping out something that we could could call acid communism for a number of years but it takes a rethinking of one's conception of class 
So one's conception of class, particularly in the British context, and sorry, I'm talking about Britain here, um, but it's, it's an affliction. I was born there. Um, is that um, the British working class didn't begin in Manchester or Nottingham or Birmingham. They are in Kingston and Karachi and Kandy. Right? And, if you, and that's not only a, a, a factual element, that's a conceptual leap that needs to be made if you're going to start making claims around popular music in, in, in Britain in that period. I had this conversation with a few friends in New York, actually, about trying to map out how some of Fisher's critiques of capital uh, and of the left play out in the US, because it, you can't just map one onto the other at all. And like one of them being, that, again, as I said before, that this uh, complete rejection of identitarian essentialism, which you, you can't take that to the US. You know, it doesn't work in the same way. At least I don't think so, anyway. What do you mean by identitarian essentialism? Because I'm kind of confused by that. I heard you use it in the last panel, and I'm kind of... Um, so, that, that, yeah, that's from his uh, essay, uh, Exiting the Vampire Castle. Yeah. So what he was arguing for was that in order for the left to sort itself out, again, another quote that was used in the previous panel was uh, solidarity without sameness. Um, but the fact that you have identities battling against one another within culture and also within the left itself, that's a problem that needs to be overcome. But that's... There's a limitation in that as well, because I mean, if you take that to the U.S., I mean, take the Black Lives Matter for, for yeah. Black Lives Matter movement, for example. Like, I wouldn't for a moment uh, say to them that you need to dissolve the individual and stop being essential about who your identity. You know. But again, um, the same applies to Britain. Britain had slaves too, and it had colonies too. Um, I mean, I'm just yeah. talking about more in relation to the present moment of what's been happening in the US. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of, again, I'm just kind of confused by what is meant by identitarian essentialism because, um, again, it takes, it takes a careful and slow and considered reading of t the history of the 20th century. So if you're talking about under this kind of form of dissolving and experimentation, that that was happening in... Um, everyday culture in Britain in places where people were from former colonies lived. Now, in, in Britain, you had this experimentation with the, what the term black meant over that, and that happened through the music. That happened around the sound system. The sound system was this kind of technology whereby something, we, something that some people like to misconstrue as identity was constantly being adap ad adapted, played with, reconfigured under conditions of intense social pressure, uh, quite intense violent social pressure. There was, it was already there. I think it was kind of brought up in the, I think Matt brought it up in the last panel, this idea that the means were already there and that it was already being done. We've just not paid enough attention to it. Um, and therefore I think the kind of criticisms of what's called identitarian essentialism are, are just uh, inaccurate. Right? I don't know where that's coming from. If you look at the history of the 20th century, it doesn't apply, it doesn't hold up for me. Identitary essentialism as, as a mechanism doesn't hold up if we look at the 20th century? Uh, it, as, a, as, a, as a kind of critique of the left or whatever the left might be, it doesn't hold up. It's not a valid criticism, it's not a valid line of argument. But what I think that Fisher was getting at was it was a more of a 21st century uh, techno-capital enabled thing for, you know, that is a product of platforms like Twitter, you know? Mm, yeah, but... Again, I don't, I don't, beyond that, where, where, was there where was there kind of evidence that this was at, at stake? Where was it? Well, evidence in, is in that essay out. in particular, he's talking about the vindication of Russell Brand over an interview he had with Jeremy Paxman. Not that I'm going to sit here and defend Russell Brand, but... Yeah, I mean, Russell Brand is Russell Brand, I mean. I no yeah, problems, yeah. I'm just indifferent by then. Yeah. Um, maybe you could bring it back a little bit to what you're talking about in terms of the sound system. Uh, were you saying that like an, an identity actually emerged from the sound system culture, or was it something that was there before? I think something like a consciousness emerged, and a way of living. Okay. I think you could call it that, perhaps. And it's still there. It's still there. Um, because yeah. a lot of people would argue. I'm not, again, I don't live in the UK, but I mean, some people would argue against that, that uh, it doesn't exist like it used to. Um, not to lose, yeah. you know. But no, um, sorry, I don't want to jump. In. Um, I think it's really interesting, at least, again, with the city, the city I live in, that um, 
there's been a proliferation, or oh, there's been various things going on in around underground music culture. You've had the development of, of kind of quite major club ventures like that we were talking about earlier, Electric Works and so on. There's been um, lots of moving small, really, really brilliant parties. Tropical Waste has returned. A place like Ormside Projects is always putting on good, good parties. But at the same time as that, I think what's been really fascinating is that although it's been going on on its own pace for years, people are going back to dub sound systems. We're going back to what? Dub sound systems. Yes, yeah, so Jar Shaka is now one of the biggest parties in town. Right? And, you, and the interesting thing about the difference between, let's say, going to as brilliant, and I love tropical waste parties, what's really fascinating about going to, to Shaka is the levels of age differentiation. You're going to get from 18 to 80. And that completely changes the d dynamic in the, on the dance floor um, in terms of how people not behave, but how they are with each other. Um, and how they are in that space. I don't know what's going on there, but I think it, there's something in that. Yeah, I think that's something I've been missing actually, is um, that breadth of kind of generational kind of uh, inclusion, which I've not really seen in a lot of things that I've been going to personally. Maybe it's what I've been going to is a bit more, more kind of like specific kind of art crowd kind of thing perhaps, which is maybe, maybe um, implicitly quite exclusive or um, but nonetheless, like, s does foster some form of consciousness, I guess, and like, it just matters. I guess this is the other kind of fault with something like acid communism, perhaps, is like it points towards consciousness raising or consciousness altering as maybe inherently good, but it doesn't, matter. It doesn't tell you how or what you're raising or altering those consciousness with, like what materials are being used, like what is the kind of artifactual instantiation of like an acid tab in a sense. I mean, like, um, a DJ could be like a really like interesting instantiation of like what acid could be in the sense that like a kind of a DJ could kind of not on their own, but kind of with the kind of uh, confluence of kind of resources that the night brings, whether like that the community and the kind of space and what that produces can kind of form like um, what you're describing, I think, in a way, but on different on different scales, I guess, as well. And sometimes that can be quite transitory, I suppose. Just to I knew this would happen, that you know, I ended up going off from the script, but just what you're talking about there, I mean, two questions maybe, but one to lead back to another example of what you were saying might be a party that I never went to, but I've read a lot about, which was, I think, called Nag Nag Nag, which is an Electro Clash party in London. Uh, but I think that might be similar to what you were saying, but I don't know if you're familiar with Nag Nag Nag, no? Okay. Um, but then, I guess this... I guess I'm a, I'm a slight cultural pessimist in that I'm not, I don't, I need to be convinced at this point because I've seen what I think are the limitations of culture and what it can produce. And, but I'm always open to having my mind changed about something, which is something that I've probably gained from reading Mark Fisher's work. Yeah. But I mean, if you were to try and maybe define, I know it's a difficult question to do, particularly at a music festival, but like what are the, maybe the limitations then of what culture can produce apart from spaces, you know? And I think like that element of spaces is quite interesting because something that I had a very interesting con conversation with someone who's spoken at CTM uh, before, Matt Drehurst, and he said like what, what is essential to this like cultural emergence of, of new sounds and collectivism and these things is that an actual physical space is needed. And I think like Akud Maktnoi, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, but it's a space in Berlin. And that's kind of an institution that's a little bit like that, you know? I mean, it's not that it's a super club or something like that, but it's a place that has an identity for fostering new things. And I'm not sure, I mean, is there any, what spaces in the UK are doing that? Like, I'm, I'm talking about, not talking about actual club nights or like collective people, I'm talking about actual a physical space. Because I think that's something that maybe gets lost in that a lot of these, um, I don't know, sound system phenomenons, they need to move from a venue to a venue and this kind of thing. Well, that's kind of exactly what I was going to pick on. But these things have to move from venue to venue. A lot of club nights are quite peripatetic. A lot of club nights are kind of, so then there was that recent kind of article, Conceptronica, which kind of named this kind of term and applied it to artists who are maybe popping up in like art galleries that got kind of like, and therefore that by virtue of doing that kind of, blushes their work with this kind of idea that it's some kind of like high art or kind of concept based thing, um, which it is, but it's also um, an instance of art of kind of musicians and club nights um, using the resources that are made available to them. Like for, I mean, there, um, there's a kind of a club night appearing at the IC in London tomorrow night uh, called Inferno. Uh, it's not the kind of place they normally set up in, but they've been obviously given a platform and been given some resources to use. And of course they're gonna use it. 
Um, so the point is, a space like you're describing is not just a single space, but it's a kind of, um, it's wherever that kind of identity travels and it kind of brings, it's like a, it's like a roving flag through the city in a way. Um, some people can see, it's like, and also some people can see it and some other people can't, it's like, I don't know. And a space is never just a space, it's also just a kind of, like you say, a kind of um, um, place where certain ideas or concepts or kind of ways of kind of talking to one another can flourish. Yes, space is, yeah, that's, that's the, space is, is, is absolutely essential and that's why it's a constant form of uh, contestation because one thing we can, uh, one of the things we can say about perhaps the, the operations or nature of capital in the last 20, 30 years is that there's been a, a it, it's turned to see the city as a resource, as a resource it can exploit and hence why space is at such a, such a premium. So that's why it's, it's so difficult to run, run parties. And I think, uh, not even run parties, but to organize in, in space because even reproducing yourself living in a city has become so tough. Right? It's become really like to you know, pay your rent, etc. So space in general is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a pressure point in a city. Um, but funny, it's talking about Conceptronica, um, there was the, uh, in our department, because Mark worked in our department, um, uh, we have a Mark Fisher Memorial Lecture, which uh, Matt is, is key to organizing and the, and the great parties he runs after the, after the lecture. So the lecture is like we invite someone to give a formal talk and then um, Matt and his friends uh, organize a party afterwards as kind of like this, this double twinned event. So we've had Kojo Eshin deliver the first lecture and then uh, Jody Dean and then this year we had Simon Reynolds. And it's not long after he's published the Conceptronica piece. And so, you know, he's come to visit, he's actually speaking to students in a workshop for a couple of days beforehand. Um, and so I say, you know, there's this party at um, Corsica run by Hyperdub called Zero, organized by Shannon SP. And um, I was like, do you want to go along? Um, and in a way, Z the Zero party is a, a, a crystallization of his argument in Conceptronica, the party normally has DJs in one room and an installation in another. Um, so I was kind of wondering if it was maybe a good idea to take him there, whether he'd like it or someone might criticize him or yell at him or something. But um, what was really interesting is that uh, Code 9 was DJing all night, who's a, I think one of, like, since Rashad passed, the, 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 the best like, selector going, that. yeah. Um, Within 10 minutes, Reynolds is on the dance floor, like going for it to a DJ lag record, I think, set him off. So um, there's, you know, maybe once he's exposed, because he lives in LA, right? Um, um, he's not really moving within the, actively within those circuits. So when he was in, exposed to what he called conceptronica, he quite liked it. Steve Goodman has that power. I'm, I'm not someone who dances myself anymore, but I saw him over the summer and I did with some dancing, yeah. There, is, there has been also like quite conscious like, efforts to um, navigating or dealing with that kind of premium on space and how difficult it is to kind of just get your hands on. It's a threshold for access that's just like so difficult for like to overcome. Um, I'm thinking of like things that have been fostered like o online. Um, as movements, I mean, the one that kind of got the most traction, I suppose, was back when like vaporwave was kind of emerging, and that was like you would see like was it 420 something f or like they just have like um, like these online parties and stuff, and I guess there's been like um, there was like a festival on the Minecraft server or something. No, was it Minecraft? I can't remember what it was. Um, and these may be like kind of stupid novelties or something, but at the same time, they are kind of, I mean, I've, I know people who were like happy to go to these Minecraft parties and like, again, it's like, I don't know who am I to kind of like scoff at someone else's enjoyment. Um, these are kind of other ways in which kind of the premium space are, is being um, navigated. Yeah, I wouldn't underestimate those spaces actually. I I went to a very interesting talk last week about that, and I would have been someone who was a little bit skeptical of it, but no, you, your mind can be changed with things. Um, just uh, to keep it on the topic of music, though, um, Danver, something you mentioned in the Glassbeat article with uh, Lee Gamble. Uh, Glassbeat is a journal I'd really recommend people read as well. But um, 
What you said was, uh, sorry, you were asked about, your, about the psychosocial aspects of music and the ways in which the nervous system of the technological infrastructure of music is ramified in the cognitive dimension of the experience of music as well as social determinations. And this is something I'd like to spin out a bit. Um, like, how can we describe music, music's actual social determinations or do we need to? I mean, maybe you've just answered this and you're talking about the, the importance of Jashak and things like this, but like, I'm, I'm, I don't know what it is about where my research has taken me in recent years, but and maybe a lot of this has to do with Suhil Malik's um, critics of contemporary art, but I would like to try and figure out what are the social determinations of music if we can figure out, because I, like, it's not to box things in, um, but it's a case of to try and clarify things so that people can understand that there's, they, they don't fall, in, fall into the false alternatives that happens when scenes get co-opted. Um, again, that's a really big question. Um, uh, and it was actually necessary to do that, as, to work that, work that out as part of a conversation with Lee. I couldn't have done it on my own. Um, and actually part of that goes back to my earlier thing about perhaps explaining or simplifying things that the questions that the, I mean, they're really nice people at Glass B, but the questions they sent us, Lee was kind of messaging me saying, I don't understand these questions. And I was like, I don't either, but let's just try and pick out something and run with it and see where we end up. Um, and um, yeah, I think a way of talking about the social determinations of music is, I mean, it's been a long running debate, like centuries long debate. So the generally the way it's looked at is that you have this relationship between the formal and the informal, right? Broadly understood. A piece of music, a cultural object, is understood as a formal thing. It has a form, has a set of uh, structures, the way it works, etc. And the social is normally understood as something that's informal. And the question is, well, how do we, under, how do we f figure the relationship between the two? Now, the, the way it's been done, there's been two approaches to it. One is the approach of what you might call a, an anthropologist or ethnomusicologist or someone like that who goes, well, I'm going to work out exactly what is going on in the formal. I'm going to, I'm, uh, informal, sorry, the social. I'm going to formalize it. So therefore, if we work that out, we can understand exactly what's going on in the piece of music. Then you have this, the other pole, which goes, no, 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 we shouldn't be doing that. We should be just looking at the formal piece of music in and of itself, separated from everything else, understand it on its own terms. Um, now, it's not a case of finding a neat path between those two. It's about kind of, I think, and the, the thing I've learned from reading others, talking to others, and just general conversation is that, well, the informal is always buried in the, in, the, in the formal. So the social is always buried in the music, and there's always music in the social. I think a prime example, and the one, something that's clarified that for me now, are like the opening, sec, opening minutes of Klein's record, Tommy, where you, you hear her hanging out with friends, and then something like music just kind of bleeds out of that. Pitch of vocal or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. And if you think about it, if you start to listen to that, you go, you hear instances of that all over popular music. That the inform, the formals emerging out of the informal. Um, listen to the first seconds of Marvin Gaye's "What's Going On," classic example. It's everywhere. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's that like, yeah, I think it's it's paying attention to that the kind of slippage slippages, the bleeds, the kind of porousness of the relationship between the two. Dane, given that your work is I mean, a bit more directed in contemporary art, maybe you'd like to, I don't know, because I, I do like to try and separate the, the analysis of music from the contemporary art, being that it's something that's quite liminal, quite you know, open-ended. I think music has a more of a determination to it, maybe. But sorry, you were yeah, about to no, no, it's interesting, actually, because I, mean, I, I, I always take the opposite, not quite opposite, but I, I don't like to kind of parse out like, contemporary art or music. Like I kind of, if, I, if I'm writing something, if I say contemporary art, I mean art objects and musical objects. No, this kind of thing I can call I like to, they're both kind of things that produce concepts and feelings and whatever um, what was the question what are you saying again the um well just if we if the way that we're trying to figure out what a social determination of music would be and mm -hmm. Danvers said that it's something that it's 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 a mixture between an, analyzing like the the ethnographic quality of it mm -hmm. along with the formalistic and they're yeah, both yeah. the two of those things are interlocked yeah, yeah. but I find with contemporary art it's far less determinate it's a lot more about value. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the, yeah. 
tyranny of, de, of uh, yeah. what was it called, uh, indeterminacy that yeah. comes from Marshall Duchamp. And that's, where I'm, that's kind of where I'm wrong in terms of like refusing to parse those things out because they actually they are different and they're socially, they have different social de determinations. They have different economies of ways of talking about them and ways of teaching them and things like that. So, I mean, for example, um, the word liminal and like a kind of economy of kind of practicing artists might maybe seem like it's kind of relegated to like a different time period, whereas for a music audience or whatever it might be more interesting, but then it can be used in so many different ways. So, I mean, um, in terms of like contemporary art, kind of having, I think, it can, it can, I think it's interesting to try and find some kind of, um, not balance, but a, a, a way of carefully navigating that kind of determinacy and indeterminacy. So, for example, one of the kind of, um, orthodoxies that kind of emerged through kind of 90s and early 2000s contemporary art was the kind of uh, art, uh, the social space as an artwork, and that became more and more indeterminate, or not more and more, but was certainly indeterminate as a kind of, the way in which an artist or a cur curator was, the, the less they kind of determined the project's outcome and determined how people would activate or work within that kind of social space that they had produced as an artwork was somehow a mark of its quality. like. Um, and that good things would emerge from the kind of the social or the self-organization of people being in this space, which is just not true. I think an interesting way to like, I guess, determine that, or could add some kind of form of determinacy, is again, to be aware of like what spaces you're producing and like what resources as an artist or an organizer you are including in that kind of open space of indeterminacy. So like, um, yeah, it's interesting to, for, for, my, for, for example, when I work with artists or musicians, I still kind of come with kind of something that I believe is like my thesis or a model through which I can like look things, uh, look through things. So it's not just a kind of indeterminate open field. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. But it's just like when you, when you start a kind of, when you, when you put on a club night, you don't just have, uh, I mean, you have a specific uh, um, sound and kind of like thing going on and I don't know. Dane, I want to, to ask you about um, that relationship between contemporary art and music, because there seems to be a lot of actually quite material crossover, like the last Klein gig I saw was at the Serpentine. Uh, Dean Blunt's kind of got a mini career in kind of contemporary art, and a lot of the musicians that we kind of listen to, like I think Juliana Huxtable, I think Misa and a few others, did MFAs, like major art colleges. So there is some interface, I was wondering if you kind of had any. Um, I feel like my answer is, mate, just gonna, is, is always going to be just a bit like, um, um, like, like it's a throwaway kind of thing. But I mean, I do, I mean, just, you're, the people, people you're describing are artists. They're just like people who have an interest in making things. I know it's not a very intelligent answer, but I mean, I mean like Dean Blunt and Klein are just like people who like want to make stuff, I guess. And, um, They've got an opportunity to like um, do that with serpentine or like with an art. I mean, it's not like a. I don't, I'm, I'm curious. I'd be curious to know how much they separate their their kind of artwork from their music work, or whether it is just kind of the same thing. Um, and I guess we're kind of when we're talking about um, um, maybe like a, uh, like a, a like a dub sound system as being a kind of distributed intelligence or something that kind of comes with the music, but also the extra musical kind of kind of characteristic as well. And I guess perhaps like Dean Blunt's kind of artwork is an extra musical characteristic of his kind of corpus. Yeah. Definitely. Let's maybe like spin that little bit out again because that's something that I think is quite rich. That idea that of music being a form of distributed intelligence. Like maybe I know that Danver, this is something that I think I've taken from your writing, maybe, but. How, how would you describe music as being a, a distributed form of intelligence? Because it's a very, very rich idea and a nice way that maybe takes it out of just the formal. Yeah. Um, it's actually a very old idea. Um, it's taken from um, the work of a writer and a musician called George Lewis. You know, if people don't know him, he's written this magnificent um, history of the, art, uh, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, uh, uh, a collective who are uh, um, still operative now, but started in Chicago in the 70s. I think George Lewis spoke at CTM, if not last year. Did he? Okay, maybe. brilliant, brilliant, yeah. And um, the idea of distributed intelligence comes from this essay he has on the blues. I think it's like called The Blues Matrix. So he's talking about a, a well-established, long-established form of music. And he says, yeah, 
the problem the problem with the way people look tend to look at blues records, he says, is they see them as markers of individual genius. And he goes, actually, they should be seen as evidence of a distributed intelligence as African Americans move from the rural south to the urban north. And that the records are these kind of time space compressions of that movement over time. And I just I read that and I was like, well, that's club records. Club records are this time space compression of something that happened in a space, but then the, the record goes on to have a life far beyond that. So it's, it's of a certain moment, yet it can't be re reduced to an understanding of that moment alone. It goes off somewhere else. And I think that's what I, I, yeah, I really picked up upon this idea of distributed intelligence. I thought it's a really neat way of thinking about a lot of contemporary music. It makes sense in terms of something like blues or even like 90s rave records or something, but in a digital landscape where everything's flattened, that, that intelligence becomes, I think, a lot harder to navigate. I don't think everything is flattened. No. Okay, please spin that out because, I, I mean, that's, it, it's, a, it's kind of a general thing that everything becomes flattened in the digital space because of you know, algorithmic suggestions, etc. I'm very open to being convinced of otherwise. Yeah, um, if everything was flattened, you wouldn't have what's going on in Chile right now as an open revolt. I think, I think that might be a way of approaching it. Yeah, things, that, things appear flattened where we are. Um, they appear flattened. Well, they appear flattened when you look at them through the prism of the digital landscape, right? That's... Um, again, going, again keep, I'm... I'm, I'm kind of really fascinated by Klein's music, but Klein's music will give us an image of the digital as a not a flattened landscape, mm -hmm. I think. No, 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 um, I can definitely see how um, the digital prism could kind of present um, an archive, a rich archive of music or musics or, or um, uh, cultural artifacts that kind of converge into a distributed intelligence and that could be flattened by that and, and evidenced by um, maybe just the vast amount of kind of uh, pr cultural producers appropriating kind of um, things without kind of prior knowledge of their kind of background. It's not a kind of hateful thing to do, but it's just a kind of way, like you're saying, like things are presented as flat. Um, and that can just, I, get, I, I can see how that can happen very easily, like to think like, um, to, just to see everything, uh, like, uh, I, 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 I've spent a lot of the last year not really listening to new music. I've been a bit, a bit too stressed out. So I find myself listening to like music from my childhood, like Marilyn Manson or something, and like all this stuff that exists on this like flat continuum for me in a way. I just kind of pick it from like Spotify or SoundCloud or whatever. Um, and it's like the archive is not really something that extends backward in history now. It's just something that's like on my desktop or something. And there's a way that kind of that treats real things as kind of flat. That it kind of yeah, that that can, that can be where the kind of problem lies, like, like the problematic in nature of like treating things that kind of have a rich history, but as. But I think it depends how they arrive at you. So it, it's there as a kind of yeah, you can access millions of hours of music on Spotify, but it happens. Spotify works, I think, but it works because it's an an engine for a set of social relations that are going on between us. So. Example off the top of my head, a friend of mine mentioned to this, me, oh, you've got to listen to this old school reggae singer called Carlton Manning. So I look it up on Spotify. He gave me, a, on the phone, he gave me an education about Carlton Manning. So I spoke to him and he kind of said, oh, here's who Carlton Manning is, here's why he's important. He was part of this group, kind of part of that group. And I kind of listened to his records and uh, they're amazing, they're brilliant in this group called Carlton and the Shoes. But what it took me to straight away was this kind of thing I was trying, I've been trying to think about with regards to the, the uses of the voice in a lot of contemporary music, and particularly I've been interested in Eve Two More and the use of voice there. And I, let, I found a way of thinking about Eve Two More by going back to Carlton Manning and thinking about, well, what's going on in Carlton Manning that gives me access to Eve Two More? Now, that happened through, yeah, conversation, and then at the same time through accessing this, this digital plane. Um, now, you could call that flatness. My ability to just quickly go and look up a Carlton Manning record was an instance of this flatness of this instant access. But it arrived through a social relation. It arrived through someone talking to me and me going to follow it up. And then I could go find my friend up and go, listen to Eve two more. Um, 
and let's, let's start talking about the two of them. Because I know a bit about Eve Timor, he knows a bit about Carter Manning, and we create something new out of that. I guess also the, I don't, I don't want to keep referring to like flatness as if it's a kind of real thing necessarily, because it's definitely arguable. But I mean, I guess another way in which that flatness can be perceived is not just through a digital prism, but also through, um, to take it back to Mark's work, the kind of, um, the detrimental effect of, of like capitalist realism on cultural production. So for example, um, older music existing on this in the same kind of cultural landscape as something like the Arctic Monkeys, who like sound like they're from, I don't know when, I have no idea. They, they sound kind of new and old and like, yeah. Um, so that can, that can just be a very, like especially when we're not listening to music through like Spotify really just, we're, we're also hearing it on like film trailers and stuff, it's weird. Like things are just being bought and sold and like we're kind of hearing them and through these kind of like weird mechanisms. Um, so to, for that to be a kind of oral landscape that like, can, can comprised of like older tunes used for like um, TV shows, but also like new bands that sound super old. I feel like that's something that's been lost to a degree, like the, the passion of finding music through films. I mean, that's how most of the music I listened to as, as a young person was, it was all formed through getting a CD of a soundtrack from a film where you heard to know what was that. Um, but to come back to what you were saying about Spotify, I, I, I have to disagree with you to a certain point in that you're in a position that you are connected to people who have a very rich knowledge of music culture and its history, and you have that yourself. But for the general Spotify listener, I do think that's a very flat landscape of consumption because you have no way of finding out what label it comes from. It's, uh, I mean, I, I'm personally someone who really, really detests Spotify. So that's why, I mean, I'm, you know, it's... Um, but yeah, we, we were talking about this before, actually, about Spotify. I mean, um, and how it, it it just changes the way you approach like music. I mean, like I, when I was younger, I would kind of buy a CD and then I would read the liner notes and find out like all the weird like thank yous and stuff. And then like it's like when you buy a book and you read the bibliography, it sends you off looking for more books. I found that with a CD. Whereas those kind of credits, like the production credits, aren't listed. Um, but it takes being connected with someone to help you to join the dots, which is you know again why. It, having a community that you're in regular contact with in relation to mm. music, something that existed in forums before, uh, is something that you know, I'd like to see materialize more now, where, again, I, I do still think that things are flattened for the general public. Yeah, um, yeah okay, but then um, let's, I agree, actually, I agree that there's a problem with regards to the discourse around music, that like, it's interesting at a time in which Music's never been so experimental and underground music's never been so conceptual. There's been a waning of the ability of platforms for people to write and think about the music. I think that's definitely a, a problem, um, a, an issue. But I think those, right, yeah, we can't, it's difficult to read liner notes, it's difficult to read, to find production credits, but a lot of that stuff is permeated in the records. Like, you always, like, artists are really working alone, they, and they'll always give production credits on the, like, produced by so-and-so or featuring so-and-so. So the work is, A, is never of a singular artist, and you get a sense of the connections. Oh, like so on, this person's working with that person. I never thought they'd, they'd know each other or make those connections. Oh, there, that track was produced by that person. So there's still something buried in there. I think it's more to do with our, our analytical capacities to how, how to go about thinking that. Because, yeah, why is it still happening? I mean, why are there people still working together even though we live apparently quite atomized, individuated lives? Why is this desire to keep on finding other people and finding people to work with? I mean, why the hell did you email me out of nowhere, right? We, didn't meet, we haven't met each other since this, like, this morning. So I, I read your work. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> That wasn't something that would have happened. I don't know, yeah, I guess but there's even there's a different autonomy involved in sending emails than there are in certain platforms, but um, just let's maybe take it back again to this thing of conceptronic, con con conceptronica, you're right, yeah, but we had a kind of like a slightly satirical conversation about this before, but, and I was saying this to Dane last night, I think that when I read through this article that Simon Reynolds had written, I didn't find anything that was highly critical because I think the things that maybe he was presenting as faults, I was finding as virtues in music. Because, like, and I, was, I mean, I kind of referenced this in the previous panel, but I think it's something that needs to bleed into this one, is that like, content-heavy work is good for you, you know? 
um, whether that's metadata or whether it leads you to somewhere else. But the idea of having a music without context or concept, it seems horrific to me. Or maybe that's something that is, it seems antiquated because it's something that you had when you had an aural hallucination in a rave in the early 2000s or something like that. That was music that maybe was without context so much as when you have a contemporary piece of whatever to use a, a phrase like experimental electronic music, the fact that it is so concept heavy is something that I find fantastic and exhilarating. But it's just interesting to kind of refer to things that happen like in a gallery space or something like that as concept heavy, whereas like something that's happening in a kind of like a, a dub sound system or kind of like someone's basement rave is not concept heavy. That seems really just inaccurate to me. Um, and that's one of my problems with that kind of phrase, that it kind of like devalues the concept kind of production of, I don't know, stuff happening 20 years ago in raves or whatever, or not even raves, just anywhere, like in your room, listening to your headphones or something. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with, with what Dane said, that um, uh, all, of the, all, all music is overloaded with concepts. Again, it's just a matter of how we dig them out and how we construct them. Uh, yes, there is a certain type of musical production at the moment which is bringing the concept heavily with it. Um, is that not a good thing? No, I don't think it's necessarily a good or bad. It depends if the concepts are good or not. And the music's there's good concept or not. Trying to there's bad concept trying <laughs> uh, to no, it's just it's an, it's an argument, right? So you kind of engage with the argument. And does, I think the interesting question that poses is if you do get music that comes with a lot of associated text, is then that kind of poses a, a, poses a different task of listening. Because then you're going, oh, does what you're hear, what hearing correlate? What's the relationship between that and the text? And that that gives a that's a kind of different type of listening mm -hmm. um, that I think it uh, uh, induces. I think the, perhaps the danger is, yeah, that there's a, an attempt to pre and over determine the musical work. That might be a danger that you're kind of already setting up the conditions for listening. Uh, but they were lining it. There's always but been lining it. But right? if generally things sound like everything else, mm. then I need that. Well, in the same way that when you go into a gallery and there's a text on the wall, you know, uh, you, you need to read that text or the artist statement or whatever it is in order to get the work. Now, some people would think that that's a, and it is a critique of